You do know that the book that you treasure, the Bible, is any way you cut it, an amazing book. It's an amazing book. Why could I ask you to close that door? It's not really a book, is it? It's a library of books. 66 different books by 40 different authors that come from every walk of life you can imagine. They include soldiers, statesmen, government workers, historians, a doctor, a rabbi, men, women, lawgivers, musicians. They come from all walks of life. The people who poured their life into that book. It's written in three different languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Very different languages. Written in three different continents of the world. Asia, Africa, Europe. Written over a period of 1,600 years. That's 60 generations. The first part of the Bible to be recorded the Torah, the instruction, the teaching, the first five books. It's separated by 1,600 years from the last book, Revelation. But with all of those variables, the differences in language, backgrounds, education, social standing, worldviews, outlooks, where they wrote it, the times they wrote it. Think about it for just a minute. How difficult is it to understand the generation before us or after us? But we're talking about 60 generations removed. But with all of those seeming barriers, you would think it would be a jumbled mess. But there's an incredible unity to your Bible, to that library that we treasure. There is a scarlet thread that ties the whole thing together from beginning to end. And everything is either pointing to, talking about, or reflecting on Jesus Christ. He is the center of everything. His life, death, and resurrection. Everything points to the Jesus event. But when did that all really start? That's a Christmas question, isn't it? When, when did it all start? That's a Christmas question. Everybody knows, and if you don't know, every year, Charlie Brown reminds us <laughs> that it starts in Luke chapter 2, when Augustus Caesar was the emperor, and Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and people were called to a census to be taxed, Mary and Joseph went down to Bethlehem. Everybody knows where it started. It starts with Bethlehem and a manger and a baby. Not quite. Christmas goes back farther than that. Oddly enough, to find the backstory of Christmas, you don't start in Bethlehem with a manger and a baby. But you start all the way in the beginning with the book of beginnings. A book called Bereshith in the original. That word means in the beginning. We're talking about the book we know as Genesis, which also means beginning because it's a book of beginnings. It's a book of firsts. There's the first humans, the first activity of God, the first creation. There's the first family, the first sacrifice. The first rules, the first use of, of metal, the first use of, of arts and crafts, the first use of music, it's all in there. The first sin, the first civilizations, the first cities, the first murder, it's all there in the book of beginnings. That's where it starts. It starts in a garden that was intended to be God's household on earth, a place where he would come and live with his family. And we are his family. That's where it starts. You know the story, though. Our first parents are visited. They're encountered. 
by this creature, some kind of a divine being that comes in the form of a snake. So the story doesn't start in Bethlehem with a manger and a baby, but it starts in Eden with a snake. And this creature comes before them with all sorts of half-truths and lies. You do know that when the enemy whispers to you, it's not usually with a full lie. But he takes some truth of God and twists it, perverts it, Take something good that God has designed for our benefit and for His glory and twist it. And He came with truths and half-truths that were just off enough that they sounded right, but they weren't right. And the enemy comes and he says to them, Hasn't God said to you that you can eat of every tree? That's not what God said. God had said you're free to eat of everything, even up to including the tree of life that would grant eternal life. You can eat from that one too, but there's one, the knowledge of good and evil tree. Don't. God said don't. In the day that you eat that, you'll be separated from me. So he begins with a lie. Didn't God tell you you could eat from every tree? No, he had not. He says, why don't you take of the one that you haven't tasted yet. Because if you will taste that, there will be a massive improvement in your life. He put it this way, God's holding back from you. And we think that sometimes, don't we? That God is denying us things for His benefit, not ours. It's never that way. God knows, He, he told them, that in the day that you eat it, you'll be like Him. You'll know good and evil. And the lie and the twisting there is intricate. Because the fact of the matter is, it was God's design always that we would be like Him. That we would be sons and daughters, imagers of the Most High God. And that's why in spite of all of the wreckage that we've caused, and all of the chaos that the way we've chosen to live life, all of that, in spite of all of that, the Word says in 2 Peter that God will still get His way one day, and the day will come when you and I will be partakers of the divine nature. It was always God's desire that we be like Him. But the enemy leads with a lie and a twist. God knows in the day that you eat of it, you will be like Him because you will know good and evil. You know the story... They listen to the lies, and they fall for the deception. And the result is, do we know good and evil? We know plenty about good and evil. There are good things in our lives that we enjoy. We're getting ready to enter into a season where hopefully the high points will be spending it with those that we care about the most. Exchanging gifts, doing things to bring joy into each other's lives. Sharing life. Are there good things? We know good. We know good music. We know good food. We know good friendship. We know good family. We know good. Look around you. Do we know evil? We know evil. Every time you look and see chaos, through the cracks in that door back there, I can see a mess across the street. That's evidence of evil. But I see it in the lives of people that are severely wounded and broken. Not only outwardly, but inwardly. Do we know evil? We know evil. We know genocide. We know what it is to see a child harm. We know what violence is. And deprivation. And racism and hatred, and ugly words. We know what ugly intentions are. Do we know evil? Yes, we do. And we have a knowledge of good and evil. Our problem is that we cannot always distinguish good from evil. That's our curse. And that event 
It puts a bend in the plan that God had, but he will not be stopped. But that's where it started. It all started. Christmas all started back in Eden with that snake, who, by the way, was not Satan. That's another one of those things in the Bible that's in the Bible that's not in the Bible. Oh, we just know that Satan tempted Eve and Adam in the garden. No, we don't. It doesn't say that. If you care more about that, we'll talk about it on Wednesday as we talk about the unseen realm. But this is not the adversary. This is something else. We're not quite sure who this character is here at the very beginning of the story until we look all the way at the end of the story in the final book, the Revelation. It tells us who this is. It's not merely a snake that talks. He's identified in the Revelation. In Revelation 20, he's described to us as that dragon, the ancient serpent, the serpent of old, who is the devil. The devil is a slanderer. The devil is a liar and accuser. Jesus will describe him as the father of lies. That's who appeared on that day and wrecked everything. But on that day, believe it or not, begins the miracle of Christmas. And there are two Christmas gifts that we are given on that day. Turn to Genesis 3. Verse 15 is where you want to camp for just a moment. Genesis 3.15 is part of the word of God to these two people and to this enemy of ours. And in verse 15... The Lord is speaking to the woman. He's already spoken and cursed the serpent. But now he's, he's speaking to the woman about the consequences, the results of what has taken place that day. And he says to her, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him in the heel. That word bruise him in the head is the word crush. You will crush the enemy's head. Your seed, Eve, will crush the enemy's head. While the seed of the devil will attempt to damage your people. And it's always been that way. But in those words to Eve, our first mother, there are two Christmas gifts. One of them is that word enmity. It's a word we don't use much. It means hostility. The Lord says from now on, between the evil one and the evil one's seed, and between the seed of woman, between every human imager, between these two groups, I will put hostility. I have put hostility. That is a gift to us. That hostility is a gift to us. Think about it. Every day we should thank God that there is hostility between the powers of evil and between us. If there weren't, we would be in much worse shape than we are. There is something within us, even when we do what we know is wrong by will. There is something within us that tells us that was wrong. When we harm somebody else or see someone harmed, we know instinctively that is not of God. It's evil. Whether it's a child molested or it's a genocide, whether it's a racial slur that's yelled out of a window, we know it's wrong, even if we do it. That's why there is not a criminal on the planet that perpetuates an ugly deed, a robbery, a breaking and entering, an assault, who stands there until the authorities get there. They always run because they know what they've done was wrong. That's because there is a hostility between the power of evil and us. We know instinctively what is wrong. And we should thank God for that. Because what that leads to, even if we perpetuate in doing wrong ourselves, and not repenting, and not laying it before God, and allowing it to fester and grow. Even if we live that kind of a lifestyle, wallowing in evil and corruption, we still know and 
there is intense misery with that. And we should thank God for that misery. Thank God for the misery of sin that in many cases is the catalyst for turning us around and back toward God. You see, we're runaways. When we live like the prodigal long enough in our misery, sometimes it causes us to turn back home. But we should thank God for that, for that hostility, for what I'm calling a, a Christmas gift here. Hostility between the enemy and us. We should thank God for that. Otherwise, the devil, listen to me, the devil would be our God. And we would become so corrupted that evil would be good and we would not be able to know. But now, we can be set free from that and even from the misery that it causes us because there is hostility between evil and us. That's one Christmas gift that we should thank God for. But there's another one in this passage. It's a gift to us. It says, I will put enmity, hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he, the seed of the woman, some human being, will crush you on the head as you attempt to bruise him on the heel. This is the very first mention of Christ. That's who that deliverer is, but let me tell you what Eve must have thought. That must have added to her sense of misery. Eve is given the command to be fruitful and multiply. To expand what has happened in Eden, the, the household, the home of God, the place of God, the place where, like we just did, God is welcomed. That was to be expanded across the earth by the children of Eve. And she receives that command and she gives birth to a child, her first. Again, another first, the first birth. And it had to be as she held that child and remembered this promise that not only would there be hostility between the evil one who has caused so much misery already and will cause more in the years to come, that not only will there be that hostility, but she will have an offspring that will put an end to it by crushing the evil one. And she had to have fought with the birth of her first child. I am looking at the Savior. I'm looking at the Deliverer in my arms that will crush His head and set us free. Not knowing that she's looking into the baby face of the first murderer. And when that event happens, how she must have grieved in her mother's heart. But that's part of it. That's part of the misery of sin, you see. But there will come one. There will come a child one day who will enter our space and our time. The God-man will come with salvation, with protection. And he'll set us free. He'll crush the head of the enemy by paying for our sin on the cross. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation, but do what? Deliver us from the evil one. He will come to deliver us from the evil one. Why, Why is the Savior, the God-man, the God-human, sent to earth? He's sent to earth because of the heart of the Father. The Word says that the Father has sent the Son. And just as the Son has been sent by the Father. Now the Son is sending you and me with the heart of God to touch people that we know that don't know. You see? That's our mission. That's what we're to be involved in as imagers of the Most High God, as daughters and sons in this family. That's why you've been saved, not to sit, but you've been saved to serve. You've been saved to tell somebody. You've been saved to disciple somebody, to help them. Why did the Savior come? He came in answer to the original promise to crush 
the head of our enemy. You see, the devil, the slander of the liar, we imagine that he is God's opposite. He's not. He doesn't have anything remotely resembling the power of God. He cannot read your mind. All he can do is lie. That's all he's got. And every time you see something ugly happen, whether it's a war that devastates thousands of families, or you see an ugly disease that's unleashed by human behavior that we ought not engage in, or you see it on a micro level where a child is abused or deprived or harmed or a spouse is beaten. Every time you see ugliness on an international scale or in the room of a home, it's for the same reason because somebody believed a lie. It's not because the devil can make anybody do anything. He's only a liar. And he's lied. And somebody has believed the lie and said, I'll be better off if I do this thing. And the enemy, the enemy has known since the beginning that a Savior is on the way who will crush him. And that's what Jesus has come to do. The devil, you see, is not so much anti-God as he is anti-human. The enemy hates you. The enemy hates you because you are an imager of God Most High. Yes. Just by your existence, not by what you do, you bear the stamp and the image of God. Yes. And when the enemy sees that, the enemy is hostile toward that. And the enemy is anti-human more than anti-God. Look at what happened when Jesus is tempted in the desert. And there's a reason why his temptation place, takes place in the desert. The same reason why the children of Israel wander for 40 years in the same desert is because it's a wasteland. It's because it's dead. It's because it's chaos. And he goes out into that chaos and he encounters the devil. Read it. It doesn't say Satan. It says devil. And there he is tested. He is tempted by the devil. But there he beats the devil at every turn. When Jesus announces for the very first time what his true intentions on the planet are, he's 30 years old, walks into a synagogue, into a meeting house, not at all different than what we're sitting in right now. And he goes to the front and he takes out a scroll and he reads from Isaiah a promise about himself. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he details, he ticks off all of the things that he has come to do. He's come with a message of good for the poor. He says, I have come to open the eyes of those that can't see. I've come to raise up the oppressed and to set people free that are in bondage. Spiritually, psychologically, physically, socially. I've come to set people free and to knock the chains off people's lives. That's why he comes. That's how he does it. And I want to turn your attention as we begin to wrap this up. I hope you brought your Bible today because I want you to underline 1 John chapter 3. Verse 4. I want you to underline it. Because it is so pregnant, powerful with meaning. Look at what 1 John chapter 3, the end of your Bible. Verse number 8. Why has the Son of God come? Why has the Savior in promise, in fulfillment of a promise way back to Mother Eve, that one would come that would crush the head of the enemy. Why has he come? Look at what the word says. 1 John 3, 8. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the work of the devil. Hallelujah! Amen. That should thrill you to the very depths of your spirit. Our Savior has come to destroy all the chaos. 
and to set us free. That's why he's come. And how is it done? We're talking about every day. How, how is that done every day? Destruction of the work of the devil in our lives, in our experience. How is that done? That he destroys that work every day. That he opposes chaos every day. Martin Luther was a reformer 400 years ago. He lived in a time when the church had lost its way. And sometimes the church does that. We're living in a time when it seems like some of the church may have lost its way. And more enamored with numbers and programs and what money can buy, more jazzed about, about the externals than about changed lives. We live in a time that needs reformation too. But Martin Luther, the great reformer, he was hounded his whole life long by the enemy. He did great work for God. Not a perfect man, but he did great work for God. And anytime you do anything, you're involved in anything that would further the kingdom, the rule of Christ on earth. Even if it's something as, as, as easy as smiling at somebody that you can tell is having a hard day. Any time you do anything for God, you make yourself a target of the one who hates us. And Luther was most a target. He was in his study one night. One of the things he felt led to do was to put the Word of God in the language that the people could read it. It was only accessible in his day to scholars who knew dead languages. He wanted to put it in his people's language, so one night he was working on that. He was working through the Gospels and putting it in his native language for the benefit of others. When he was visited by the devil, the slanderer, the liar appeared to him. Visibly, he wasn't shaken by his appearance. But what he said began to work its way into Luther's spirit. As the enemy took a scroll and unrolled it and flung it across, it was so long the length of the room and then some. And the enemy handed it to Martin Luther and said, Read it! Luther realized that it was the history of his sin. It was all of the things, large and small, that he'd done when in self-destructive mode or to hurt somebody else or in rebellion to God or in negligence to the things of God that had introduced chaos along the way. It was all there for him to read and he began to read down that list. It was long. There were sins that he had long forgotten. But they were his. He couldn't escape them. They were there. They were his. He had done it. And as he read down that long list, his heart sank lower and lower. The feeling of hopelessness, of being drowned, of being waterboarded under his own guilt, began to overwhelm him. He began to despair in his heart. And the enemy began to laugh. How twisted this enemy is. He began to laugh at his misery. When a verse from the Word of God that he had memorized as a boy. You need to memorize the Word of God. The day may come when you won't have a Bible handy. There are people in this room, you may live long enough, they won't let you have one. Without consequence. You may find yourself on a sickbed someday and unable to turn pages. You need to memorize the Word of God. He had memorized a verse as a child from that same book that we read from, 1 John. And as he reads through all of his sins and the enemy is delighting, the further he goes in the lists, 
Luther's heart is sinking until the verse flashes across his mind and he blurts it out and he says, it's true, that's all mine. But the word of God says that Jesus Christ has come. And the blood of Jesus Christ delivers me from all sin. Amen. Hallelujah. How is it done every day in our everyday experience that the, the, the power of the enemy is broken? That, that when the devil comes to us, we can throw him off. We can crush his head again. It's when we remember we remember that we belong to Most High God. And that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. That's how it happens every day. That we remember we're not an outsider, we're an insider. We're daughters, we're sons, we're imagers. We're the object of His attention, His affection. And that God includes us, not only in what He's doing, but He includes us, Father, Son, and Spirit, in who He is. That's what it means when it talks about us being in Christ, and Christ being in us. We live in God, and God is living His life in us. It's just that close, you see? And that's how we crush the enemy every time, is we remember... We remember what Christ has done for us. Two Christmas gifts. Hostility between us and the enemy. We should thank God for that. And that the enemy has been crushed. Hallelujah. And we've been set free. We've been set free. Stand with me. There is no other way to respond than to allow a heart of gratitude to have expression. It pleases the heart of Christ to hear us thank you. Thank you. Oh, it sounds so simple. We treat a child, a preschool, with the importance of thank you. This morning, I said something to Matt's little girl. And Matt, the good daddy, he said, what do you say? And she said, thank you. And it seems so simple and almost childish. But gratitude is what touches the heart of Christ. So the right response to the reality that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, crushing the Satan's head. The, the right response to that is to lift your hands and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. As you think of a blessing from Christ, thank you. Thank you. If you got it and it's good, it's come from the hand of a good God. Thank you. Thank you. As your blessings flash across your mind, Thank you. Oh God, for my children, thank you. For the way you provide for me, thank you. I am not on the street, thank you. I am healthy to a degree, thank you. My mind is clear enough, thank you. Hallelujah, I have brothers and sisters, thank you. I have a church that's worth coming to and being a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But most of all, you have set me free and you protect me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to do something for me. We're not going to gather in this room at 5 o'clock tonight. We've had our prayer time. So we'll not be gathering here today at 5. But what I want you to do sometime this evening, even if you've never done it, kneel down in your home and just 
pray. Welcome, Father. Spend a moment in repenting for the things that put a barrier between you and God. Begin to plead for the lost that you know. Ask God to help with the big things and then take authority over the enemy. And you can up your game if you would include some other members of your family in that short prayer. I'm going to ask you, would you do that tonight? How many will say, I'll do that in my home tonight? I'll make my home a place of prayer. So, Father, bless us. Let this be a Lord's Day indeed, a day that is filled with you, with your presence, the sense of your presence. Thank you. We pray in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. 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 Turn around tell somebody you love them. And we'll look for you on Wednesday, Unseen Realm. You talk about wacky stuff. Bring your Bible. Bring your Bible.